on behalf of the Lucy Craft Laney Museum of Black History, Mustard Seed Video Production, and the Watson Brown Foundation, we are here today to talk with Dr. Judy Carter, whose influence is quite literally all over the Southeast. We'd like to start with Dr. Carter, please tell us where you are from. Okay. I'm from a little town about 44 miles from Augusta. The name of it is McCormick, South Carolina. I was born there, raised. We left McCormick when I was 11 years old and moved to the North Augusta area. But um, that's, that's where I'm from. Wonderful. And please tell me what your upbringing was like. Okay, it was quite interesting and probably unlike what you may think. I'm from a single mother home. My mother had three children. I'm the youngest of the three. I have a sister who is still living. She's 91 years old. I had a brother who passed away in his early 30s. So she was a domestic worker. She worked for a family called Browns. So she worked for the Browns, and I don't remember how many years because when I remember her working there, she had already been working there a long time for that same family. Uh, they were very nice people. They were, I think about when I saw the movie, The Help, I thought about her. She didn't go through any of that kind of thing with the people she worked for, like couldn't use the bathroom and, you, and all of that. And she used the bathroom. I used the bathroom when I was at their house because I used to go to work with her in the summertime when school was out. But anyway, it was a different kind of in, environment. But um, I am supposed to be a statistic. That's always the way I used to think of myself because when you hear of girls who were raised in single parent homes and that kind of thing, they usually start having children very early with no husbands and that kind of thing. My mother, even though she was a domestic worker, we were poor. We were very poor, but we always had lots of food. I never ever remember being hungry, not ever in my life. And I think that was a blessing uh, according to the, the way we were living. And, um, so, and we always had nice, clean clothes. And we always looked presentable when we went out, when we went to school, when we went to church, uh, or whatever, wherever we went, we always looked nice. She made sure of that. So I knew my father, even though they were not married to each other. I saw him almost every day. He was coming to our house. So even though I was raised without him living there, I knew him very well. When I was sick and couldn't go to school, he would stay with me while she went to work. So that was a kind of different situation also. Oh, let's see, what else can I tell you about uh, McCormick? Oh, it was, I think we had one stoplight in McCormick when, when I came along. I think they have two now, <laughs> not much more. But um, McCormick has grown in a way because now they have something called Hickory Knob. And people go there for family reunions and and all they have cabins and all kinds of things it's right across the road from Savannah Lakes I don't know whether you've heard of either of those or not Savannah Lakes is a very beautiful uh, section and it's on the on the Savannah River people have beautiful homes over there and, and that kind of thing there's a hotel in that area also none of that was there during my time so, let's see, I'm trying to think of something else I can tell you about my upbringing. My mother worked very hard 
for this family. And not only did she clean, as I said, she cooked. She, she did everything for them. In the summer, when I was not in school, she took me with her. I mean, they were in walking distance of our home and their home. So she walked to work every day. And um, so she would take me with her and she would let me dust the furniture while she did other things. And uh, they had a piano in it. And, and I used to always want to bang on that piano. Didn't know anything about notes or anything like that. But I used to love to sit there and just pretend I was playing some song or something like that. So that went on for until I was 11. Oh, my father was killed in a hunting accident. He loved to hunt. He had buddies who went hunting with him. And one day they went hunting and he had a heart attack while they were hunting. And the doctor said that he was dead before he hit the ground. It was just massive like that. I believe I was probably uh, nine, maybe eight or nine years old when he passed away. So then she had no help. My sister got married and moved to South Carolina. And um, later on, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, I went to live with her. Her husband worked at night, and she was always afraid at night. And she asked my mother if I could come and stay with her. And my mother said, if she wants to, she can do that. So I did. So I stayed with her a long time until I got married. I was 19 years old. Uh, and um, so she she's sort of like a mother to me instead of a sister because she is... 11 years older than I am. Um, and I helped her when she started having children. I was there as the live-in babysitter and, and caretaker. So I was a big help to her while I was staying there. So that's it about um, where I came from. Uh, oh, in the house we lived in, we had no running water in the house. It was almost a shack. But it was a clean shack, very clean. But we did have electricity. And I don't understand why we didn't have running water, but we didn't. We had a well in our backyard where we drew water. And uh, think, oh yeah, it was interesting about taking a bath. And we had to take a bath every night. And my mother would draw the water, heat it on the stove, which was a stove that had wood. We had to burn wood there. And she would heat up the big old thing of, of uh, water, put it in the tin tub, and then she would pour some cold water in it to make it the right temperature. And that's the tub we took a bath in, all of us. So I would take the bath and after crying because um, I was very spoiled and she would wake me up from my nap after playing so hard. I was tired and I would go to sleep. I don't know why she let me do that. But she would wake me up, make me take my bath, then put me to bed. So, uh, so that went on every night, the crying and taking the bath in the tin tub. So, but, we, but we did have electric lights in the, in the house. So that's, that's about it with the kind of uh, place I was in in my beginning. Wonderful. That is just so amazing <laughs> to hear about that. And I know it's it's still challenging today to be a single parent. So I know that it must have been it, it must have come with so much um, for your mother. And I'm sure that she was a huge influence on you. Can you tell yes. me any major moments from your childhood that you feel like? impacted you or formed you into the woman you are today? Well, I, I think my mother had a big influence on us. Even though she was a single mother and a domestic worker and poor, she had a lot of pride. Uh, she was a big worker in her church. 
Uh, she was a worker in the school I attended when they had different occasions. She would give them money, and sometimes they borrowed things from her from the house to if we had a play or something like that, and she would provide things for the play. And everybody knew her, and they knew they could depend on her to help. So I'm a lot like her, and as I get older, I think about how much I am like her. But she had, as I said, she was very proud, and she expected us to be that. And one thing that she said to us a lot, don't hang your head because you're poor. That doesn't mean because we are poor, it doesn't mean we are no good. So I want you all to understand that you are important and, uh, and, and I want you to like yourself because I love you a lot and I want you all to like yourselves and not feel ashamed of where you have come from. And uh, so that was instilled in us all the time. I mean, I, I kept saying, why do you keep saying that? We got it. You know, don't you keep saying the same thing to us. We understand. But she kept repeating it and repeating it. And uh, then we started believing it. And I'm a very bold woman. Uh, and I think I got that from her because she made us think we were important. I so love that. <laughs> and if I recall correctly, you relocated to North Augusta mm -hmm. as a almost preteen. Mm -hmm. uh, I went, I was in the seventh grade when, I, when we got to, to uh, South Carolina and uh, there was a school over there called Jefferson had Jefferson Elementary and Jefferson High School it was combined and that's where I went to school when we went to the Augusta area uh, the North Augusta area I mean um, I made friends very quickly because I was always outgoing my sister was very, the opposite of me she was very quiet and, and um, didn't talk much now she does but um, she didn't back then, but I always made friends very quickly. It's very easy for me, and because of the way my mother had taught us uh, back when we were younger. But uh, Jefferson was a, an interesting school, and um, we had wonderful teachers there, and it was all black, and I had left an all black situation, so that's what I was used to. The teachers were very interested in us, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the teachers later on. But uh, we still have uh, reunions at Jefferson, even though it turned, in, it turned into a middle school, and it's not a elementary high school anymore. But uh, we still get together every three years, and uh, no matter what class you were in, uh, we get together and have a good time and reminisce about Jefferson and what Jefferson meant to us. One of the girls now uh, is writing a book about Jefferson and its graduates and, and all that kind of thing and how we got to where we are now. We had a, a teacher named Reverend Nathaniel Irvin. Uh, he was very uh, well known in the Augusta, North Augusta, Aiken area. Uh, he was the minister at Old Storm Branch Baptist Church. Well, before he passed away, he often talked about a book. He was going to write a book about the graduates of Jefferson because so many of us turned out really well. And uh, he thought that was unusual that so many of us uh, turned out the way we did because most of us were country children. Uh, we had a few who lived in North Augusta. They weren't country because North Augusta is not a farming area. But where I came from was definitely a farming area. My brother-in-law was a farmer, one of the things that he did. 
and I know how to farm and I know how to drive farm equipment. He taught me how to drive those great big tractors and, and all of that. So uh, I knew how to do it and he depended on me. He used to bring his vegetables over to the market here in Augusta and I would always Look, I was driving. I didn't have a driver's license because I was too young. But I, if he didn't feel well, he told me to drive the truck, <laughs> and I did. So uh, <clears throat> that was really interesting, you know. Uh, and and uh, so I, I tell people, and I have to remind my husband sometimes when he doesn't want me to lift things. And I said, look, Jimmy, you have to understand, I'm a country girl. I grew up on a farm. I'm used to lifting heavy things, but I don't want you to do it now. Let me do it, you know. But he can't get it sometimes that I'm a real country girl. That's so awesome. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Dr. Carter. Do you have any theories on why so many of the Jefferson graduates were so phenomenal and went on to do so much? You know, I don't. Uh, I, I think most of us had strict parents and uh, they took school very seriously. <clears throat> I think all of our parents, <clears throat> excuse me, took school very seriously. They had a great respect for teachers. I mean, we couldn't ever do anything wrong because our parents always took the teacher's side no matter what. It was, it was us. We were always wrong, not the teachers. And sometimes the teachers would be wrong. But our parents, oh no, they, they wouldn't hear that. It's nothing like today. <laughs> Wonderful. And I, I do want you to know if ever you need to take a sip of water, you okay. can edit it so you feel comfortable to Thank do that. Thank you. <clears throat> that, that's wonderful. Would you, you mentioned some teachers a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me who influenced you or, or how did you decide that education would be? Okay. Well, I really didn't decide that education was going to be my career. That was, um, I kind of went in through the back door. I, we didn't have any money, so going to college was never an option. We, we never discussed going to college in my family. That was a conversation that was never had. So when I finished high school, I was going to go into the Army. I thought that would be the best thing I could do. And uh, my brother said, no, you don't want to go into the Army. He said, women who go into the Army don't have a good reputation. And I, I wouldn't want you to do that. So I said, well, what am I going to do? I knew I didn't want to be a domestic worker. That's what I had seen. And uh, I didn't want to do that. So some of my teachers, had got me together and said, Judy, you keep saying you're not going to go to college. I said, well, I'm not. We don't have any money. And uh, one teacher said, well, do you have anybody in your family you could borrow some money from? I said, well, I do have an uncle we go to all the time when we need something. <clears throat> and he is very generous. Maybe, maybe I could t go to him. So she said, well, I'm going to get you an application to go to Payne College because I graduated from Payne College, she said. So she said, I'll have an application for you in a few days and I'll help you fill it out. So then I went to my uncle and I told him I wanted to go to college. And he said, well, how much will it cost? <clears throat> well, she had told me how much it would cost and back then, it just seemed like not much to me compared to today. But he gave it to me. I think it was $250 or something like that for the semester. And so he, he gave it to me, and she helped me fill out the application. And that's how I got in college. But I had no idea I would ever go to college. And um, <clears throat> so it was really nice. But I didn't have any idea about what I wanted to be. My mother had an idea since, okay, since he gave us the money, and she picked nursing for me. I didn't choose it. She loved nurses for some reason. 
I think it's the uniforms or something, but she just loved nurses. So I said, well, I guess that's good as anything. So I applied for nursing school and I got accepted to nursing school. We lived on the Payne College campus. All of the black uh, girls in the nursing program lived at Payne in the dormitory. The white girls in that same program stayed in a building on uh, the University Hospital's campus. Uh, so we didn't mix at all. Got to, we took our core, core classes at Payne with the professors here. <clears throat> Then we went to the University Hospital to take the nursing courses. And guess what? In the classroom, they had us on one side. There's an aisle in the middle, separated us. The white nursing students on the other side. And we were virtually ignored during the lectures. They didn't look at us. They didn't ask us any questions and didn't invite us to ask them any questions either. So that's the way that was. <clears throat> My mother, as I said, wanted me to be a nurse. I was very nervy, and I think that's why she thought I should be a nurse, because across from where she lived, this couple lived, and they always had fights, and he would always beat her up and all that kind of stuff. And one day, he stabbed her with a screwdriver, and my mother said to me, Judy, go over there and see if he killed her. Now, she wasn't going. She sent me. <laughs> so I went over there, and I checked for a pulse, and I didn't feel anything. And actually, I didn't see any blood. And he was yelling, the man, I killed her, I killed her. And he was running all around in the street yelling. So somebody called the police. Police and the ambulance came. And I stayed right there until they got there. And they checked her out. And the, the, the EMT said, she's not dead yet, but she is dying. We'll take her to the hospital, but she probably won't even make it alive there. But anyway, they, they took her. And sure enough, she died on the way to the hospital. So this crazy man got, was arrested, and he spent time in prison for killing her, you know. But I said all that to say I was nervy. That didn't make me nervous or anything to check a pulse or any of that. So when I got in nursing school, I didn't like it because there were parts of it that just made me sick. Like we had to make a bed with somebody in it who had defecated and all of that. And we had to change the bed, change the person also, without getting them out of the bed. That made me sick. I couldn't eat the first time I was assigned that I couldn't eat for three or four days. I was just sick. Every time I thought about food, I would get sick. I was throwing up all over the place. You know, None of my, my uh, friends did fine with it. So... <clears throat> But anyway, I said, oh my goodness, this is not for me. So I was talking about that to some of my former teachers. And they said, well, if you don't like it, you don't have to do that. You know, there are other things that you can do. And why don't you think about teaching? We know you would make a good teacher. You have the personality for it. And I said, well, I never thought about that either, because like I said, I didn't think about any kind of career because I wasn't going to have one. So they insisted that I th look at education. So my mother wanted me to be a nurse. I wanted to go in the Army. My teachers wanted me to be an educator. <laughs> so that's how education came in the picture. So I went and changed my major and became an educator, and that was my niche. I absolutely, positively love education. May we know the name of the teacher that helped get you into school? Yes, her name was Mary Ann Bright, and she's, she passed away also. Most of my teachers in high school passed away.
Can you describe your younger self when you were first starting out in, we will say education, and you say you really, really enjoy it. Has it always been that way since the beginning? Since the beginning. Love it, love it, love it. And I, when I was um, in the public school system, I loved teaching. I had sixth graders. That was the first grade I taught. And I loved it when most people thought I was crazy. How, do you, how can you like sixth graders? Those kids are crazy. But they weren't crazy. They were absolutely the sweetest little people you ever wanted to meet. We got along just fine. We did all kinds of things. And uh, if you want to talk about those a little later, I'll tell you. But I was recruited to come to Payne College by the president at the time. His name was Dr. Julia Scott. And uh, he had read different articles in the paper about my students and what we were doing and so forth. So he asked me if I would come and help train future teachers there. And of course I said no. I wasn't about to go work in a college. I was enjoying the level where, where I was. And uh, so my husband even convinced me. He said, why don't you try it? You might like it. You don't know. So he stayed on me about trying it. And I broke down. And I accepted the position to come to Payne College to head up teacher education. You know. But I went to the Board of Ed and I told them, I said, now, I'm going to leave, but I want my job back because I'll be back in a year. I said, I know I'm not going to like this. So um, they said, okay. So they said, we'll hold your job for you. So in a year, you come back and we'll, you'll have it. But when I got there and met those kids, I fell in love with that level. And I said, oh, this is wonderful. So there I was teaching on the college level. You know? <laughs> And I, when I was reading about you, I did see that you have had extensive experience at several different universities and colleges across the Southeast, um, New Orleans, one in North Carolina, Benedict, where my nephew played football, mm -hmm. um, of course, Augusta University, Okay, yeah. and of course, Payne College. So mm -hmm. can you tell me about those different career moves and, and how you... Your experiences just within the historically black settings and then also the predominantly white institutions. Okay. All right. Oh. <clears throat> now, here I am at Payne, loving it. Built a wonderful program, very much respected all over. Recruiters heard about my students, and they would come with contracts. No interview. They said, oh, you finished this program here at Payne, so we know you're good. And sometimes they didn't even interview my students. They just offered them a contract. And I had told my students, when they would be mad with me for being so hard on them, I said, one day, when you get to the end of this program, you're going to love me because people are going to come wanting you to work in their schools. And they didn't, they didn't really believe that was going to happen. But when it happened, oh my goodness, I was the best thing since popcorn, you know? <laughs> they were so proud of themselves. But the program was not easy. I had, I'm just backing up a minute. But when I first went to Payne, um, there were some students in the teacher ed program who should not have been in a teacher ed program. They were not ready for that. They were not, in, and excuse me, but they weren't intelligent enough to teach anybody's children. And uh, so I had to go to the president and have a conversation with him about some of these folks need another major. And uh, so he understood. And uh, when students went to him complaining that I had asked them to get another major, he knew that was going to happen. So he had already gotten it from me. Why? So he supported me in them getting another major. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's what <clears throat> that's what was going on with to to let you know why 
I was I was asked to come to other schools after I had, and, and I'm not trying to take the credit because I had people working with me who were just as good as I was. And they had the same beliefs that I had about education. So it was a team effort to build these programs. You know, I was just the, the coach, you know, I just led them on and coached them and, and all of that. But I by no means want to take the credit for building these programs by myself. I didn't do that. So anyway, got the program. Everybody knew about it. Recruiters are coming. Some recruiters will call me on the phone and say, I know we're supposed to come there for a certain date, but I want to come early. Is it possible that you can let me come a few days early to talk to some of these people? So I said, okay. I guess I probably shouldn't have done that. But I said, okay, and they would come, the ones who wanted to come early, I let them come, and they would get students' contracts and all like that before the others got to them. So, all right. <clears throat> all right, so now I get this call one day from the president of Dillard University in New Orleans. I said, my goodness. What's going on? Now, I really need to back up a little bit more before I tell you that story. I had a co-worker who was Caucasian. She and I had traveled together to USC. We were in the same program, in the, in the doctoral program. We carpooled and all of that. So when my evaluation team came, when NK came, she tried to sabotage the program. And lucky me, one of the evaluators came to my office and told me about it. She said, I know you don't know this because I think you all are friends and I know your coworkers. But she was telling us all these things that you had made her do and she didn't have the qualifications. And we didn't quite believe it, so we wanted you to know what was going on. All right, so I was so hurt because I really thought she was my friend. But I said, she has to go. So I called her in and I told her what they told me. She denied it, of course. But I said, Elizabeth, I'm sorry, but I'm going to recommend ter your termination. And uh, of course, she was still denying everything. So I wrote a letter to my boss, who was the, the dean, uh, and uh, uh, academic dean, and uh, he approved it, and he took it to the president, because we, we were following protocol, and the president didn't approve it. Now, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I already told her she's going to be terminated, but now she's not going to be terminated. So, how am I going to work with somebody like that? So anyway, the president said, well, can we wait another semester? I said, no. I said, I can't wait another semester. If she doesn't leave now, I can't come back. I'll have to find another job. So he was very upset with me. He, he wrote me a letter, very uh, disturbing, telling me that if I left, we weren't going to, we couldn't be friends anymore and that kind of thing. Well, I said, told you, I'm bold. I said, okay, if that's the way it has to be. I'm, he said, well, you established in Augusta. Your husband is here. I said, I'm sorry, but I can't work here with her here anymore. So I wrote a letter of resignation. No job. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I thought, this is my confidence. I'm good at this. Somebody will want me. Somebody will, will call me. And you know how God works. And I'm a firm believer in God. My faith is very strong. I don't know how many days after I resigned that Dr. Cook from Dillard University called me and said, I know you don't know me, but you've been highly recommended to come to Dilla to rebuild our teacher education program. And I said, 
are you kidding? <laughs> he said, no, I'm not. He said, you were highly recommended. I've done a national search, he said. I haven't found anybody who I think can do this. And you've been highly recommended by some educators I know. So I went home and I didn't accept and I didn't reject. I told him I would think about it. I went home and told my husband about it. And of course, he said, you've got to be kidding. You can't go. You, what are you talking about? Going to New Orleans? You don't know anybody in New Orleans? I said, I know I don't. <laughs> so he was highly against it. I mean, we, we've been married so long. We've been married now 54 years. But anyway, I had a family meeting about it. I called my sister and her husband and my friend, my best, what I, who I thought was my best friend, my children. And we had a family meeting and my husband. And he walked out of the meeting. He just couldn't take it because everybody else was saying, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. <laughs> so he didn't think it was a good opportunity. So he, he left the meeting. But um, after all of that, I, Dr. Cook, called me back and he said, I'm not, I don't want to worry you, but I want to invite you down and look at the campus. He said, I won't be on your back about it. I'll just leave you alone, but just come down and look at the campus. And, and uh, I said, okay. He said, all expenses paid. So he, I flew down to New Orleans and, and I said, uh oh, that was my first mistake. The campus is absolutely gorgeous. All the buildings are white, white brick, and the, gra the green grass, the trees, they have something on called Alley of the Oaks, and uh, all these oak trees, and it's just beautiful. And I said, oh, oh, Judy, you shouldn't have come down here to look at this campus. <laughs> so, but I still didn't make up my mind to come down there because I went back home and, oh, he called me in and he said, let's talk about a contract just in case you decide you will come. Uh, what would it take with to monetarily, what would it take to get you here? Well, I had talked with a friend of mine about that. And the friend told me what to say to him. He said, Dillard has a lot of money. And so don't go easy on them. Just, just ask for this big amount. Well, I just couldn't believe I could ask for that big amount. Um, it just didn't seem right to me. It didn't seem legal because I knew what I was making. And this was so much more that I just didn't think I could do it. So anyway, I told him a big amount, but not as big as my friend told me to ask for. So he didn't bat an eye. He said, well, okay, that, that sounds okay. He said, um, I'll stop by my office before you go back to the airport today and um, I'll have something for you. So I stopped back by his office. He gave me an envelope. He said, don't open this until you get on the plane. So I said, okay. So he and his wife took me back to the airport and, um, and I just couldn't wait to open it. And there was the exact amount that I said I would come for. A contract ready for me to sign. So when I got back home, I told my husband and I showed him that and everything. And he was getting sadder and sadder. And I said, uh oh, my chance of going here is very slim because he is not going to agree to it. And he didn't. He didn't agree to it, but uh, what he did after he found out how excited I was about it and what a boost that was going to be to my career, then we rented a U-Haul, neither one, but he had never driven a truck before. I had, being from the country. Uh, so we rented this U-Haul and I bought, we went shopping for furniture. I didn't want to take my furniture out of my house because he was still going to be there. So I bought furniture for this apartment that had been shown to me. Uh, and so we drove down to New Orleans, got in my apartment. 
uh, well, we had, he had been there. I've skipped his whole lot, but he had been down there with me. The second visit, Dr. Cook said, bring your husband with you so he can see the campus and, and, uh, and maybe help you pick out a place to stay. So, um, so anyway, he went with me, and we had a wonderful weekend on Dillard. We stayed in the big hotel, and all we had to do was sign whatever we wanted. Just sign the thing. And uh, we had, had a wonderful time. And, and, of course, my husband loves jazz, and we went to a jazz place and all of that, you know. But anyway, I accepted. We moved down there, and um, my husband was still upset with me about it. But he finally said, I'm going to support you. This is what you want to do. This is going, you want this to boost your career? And I will say, okay. So once he got okay with it, everything else just fell into place, you know. So we had a plan how we were going to visit each other. We would come, I would come home on a certain weekend, maybe skip a weekend, and he would come down to, to New Orleans, and, and we did that. And uh, we would fly out of, I would fly out of Atlanta, um, and then, because the, the ticket would be cheaper, and then we had a plan where when I would fly home for a weekend, we would eat a really nice dinner in Atlanta first, and then we would drive on to Augusta. So it was really fun. It was fun, and I was enjoying it so much, and sure enough, my career went haywire. It just went crazy. Now, Oh, that's enough of, of you wanted to know about the other schools I went to also. Sure, yes, oh, okay. And the differences. Oh, I loved that story. Thank you for sharing. And, and also your experiences and, and some differences when it comes to historically black institutions mm -hmm. and predominantly white families. Okay. All right. Well, I, I told Dr. Cook when I accepted the position at Owls, it will take me five years to rebuild this program because I knew that as I had done it before at Payne and it takes a good five years to get it back nationally accredited. You know? So he said, I said, well, I'll stay five years, the work will be done, then I'm, I'm going back home. And he said, okay. So that's the way we left it. So uh, that happened. He left in four years, he retired. So that left me with another president for one year. And we didn't hit it off at all. But anyway, <laughs> we, uh, I stayed that last year and uh, just really made great friends there. I mean, it's, it's a, have you ever been to New Orleans? Oh, okay. Well, you, you need to go. That's, that's, put that on your bucket list. I mean, it's like no other place. And people used to say that, and I didn't understand it until I actually lived there. The people are different. They are so family oriented. And they just took me in, just like I was one of the family, invited me to birthday parties and Thanksgiving dinner, because it's one Thanksgiving I didn't come home for it. And there I had two or three invitations to have dinner with them and their families and invited me. And when Jimmy would come, they would party with him and get have meals for him, and so he got to love them too, you know. So they're wonderful people. They are wonderful people there. Yes, they do love to eat, and they do know how to cook, and they do like to have fun. But they are serious about everything they do. So that was that made it easy for me to be there because there were so many wonderful people who. I was, I was in an apartment building that had been built for senior citizens, but they let other people move in because they didn't have enough senior citizens to fill it up. So in the apartment I'm building, my next door neighbor was a senior citizen, and she never had children, and her husband had been killed. So she was living there by herself, and she just took me over. She just adopted me. I am her daughter now. Every Sunday when I was there, she wanted me to have dinner with her. Every Sunday. And, uh, and 
I was telling my husband about it. He said, that just seems like you spend too much time. I said, well, Jimmy, she invites me. What am I going to do? And somebody had told me, when they invite you to dinner, don't turn them down. Because that's an insult to them if you turn them down. I didn't want to insult the lady. I liked her. She's sweet as she could be. So I had Sunday dinner with her. She didn't want to eat by herself anymore. And uh, here I am, her daughter that she never had. You know. So uh, that was a wonderful experience, a, a beautiful relationship. And Jimmy met her when he came, and she just fell in love with him and all that. So anyway, what was I saying? What, 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 I forgot my part. Where am I oh, going? That's no problem. Okay. You're, um... Talking about leaving. Oh, when I left New Orleans, my next position was going to Fort Valley State University. The president, I had, he and I went to Payne College together. So we knew each other really well. Now he, he had been the president at a college in Texas, Texas Southern, I believe was the name of it. Uh, and he had done really well there. But they asked him to come to Payne because Dr. Scott was leaving and come to Payne and do a good job there, and he did. But um, he also, when he left Payne, he went to Fort Valley State. He did that for a temporary thing. He didn't go there to be there forever. But um, then Fort Valley State University had lost all of its accreditation, local with the State Department of Education, Georgia, and national in Cape. They lost everything. So he flew to Columbia, because I was now at Benedict. And uh, he flew over there. And we had lunch together. He brought all these papers. He brought a box of things for me to read to show me just what bad shape they were in. And he said to me that the chancellor had already selected a person to come there and be the dean of the College of Education. He told the chancellor, I'm sorry, sir, but I know who I want to come here, and I don't want anybody else to come and try to fix this program except her. So the chancellor gave in to him and said, OK, even though he had already picked somebody. So anyway, I didn't know whether I knew where Fort Valley was in the country. And I did not want to go there. I mean, it was dead country. And I had grown up, and I didn't want any more country. So anyway, he wouldn't take no for an answer. And he just wore me down. So finally, I said, OK. Now, another thing that encouraged me <laughs> to go there was the salary. It was more than I made at. Dillard because it's a state school. See, Dillard is a private school. And I didn't know what state school people made. But boy, they make some money. So I said, OK, let me try this. So, so I accepted that position, Dean of the College of Education at Fall Valley. And I told them the same thing, five years. That's all I can give you, five years. Now, it's much closer to home and all of that because I went home every weekend. I got an apartment there, and um, and I was home every weekend. And uh, if I had a really busy weekend and I couldn't go home, then my husband would come and spend the weekend there with me. So that worked out fine. But I stayed there five years. And let's see, in three years, we had uh, the state accreditation back. I had a great team. I had to get rid of about three people now who were just getting the welfare check from the school. And I told the president, these people just getting the welfare check. They're not working. They're just getting money. And uh, I can't work with people like that. So he said, OK, Dr. Carter. He said, um, when do you want them to go? I said, as soon as you can let them go. He said, OK. And by the week's end, they had gotten their letters to be out of there. That's, that's how confident he was in, in me 
And also, he was a graduate of Folk Valley State University, so he loved the school. He loved the school. He was a smart man. Uh, and um, so we, we did that, and um, I, I, I just can't tell you how I knew I wasn't going to like working at Fort Valley, and I knew I was going to have to work harder than I ever worked in my whole life because they lost everything, and we got to get it back. But I fell in love with Fort Valley. I don't know what. I think they worked through things on me, you know, like people, <laughs> like people say. <laughs> and I knew all the graduates, alums, loved Fort Valley. And I'm thinking, why do you all love the school? It's out here in the woods. There's nothing around, you know. Anyway, I mean, you ought to see the alums. They just love that place. So anyway, uh, we got settled there. And I told them about the five years I could stay, and then I would be out of there. And they said, okay, fine, fine, fine. Three years, as I told you, we had the state accreditation back, and that was, everybody was so excited about that, they didn't know what to do. They were so excited because they loved it, and they didn't want it to be non-accredited. So then now we have two more years to go. Oh, I just had three, two more years to go before I will have to leave. And uh, so we worked really hard to try to get the national accreditation back. So they, we, did, we had to visit from the national accreditors. And they had about four days on campus looking at everything and talking to everybody and looking at our records and all of that that they do. They work hard, too. And uh, so then we had a meeting, and they said, okay, you guys made it. We'll, we'll make it public, but you guys got it, you know. So, uh, so that my work was done, and then I resigned and uh, told them I was going home. And they had the biggest going away party for me you have ever seen. It was magnificent. It was so wonderful. Most of my family members went, and a couple of my friends I invited. They went to it and. And we just had a really nice time. So that was my getting there. So I'm going home. I said, well, I'm through for a while. I won't be working for a while. And I'll just sit around with my retired husband and, and be retired. Well, that didn't last long. Phone rang. Here comes the, um, I, I even forgot now when I went to the next school, was it after um, was it after Fort Valley or was another school between? But anyway, I know I went to South Carolina, I mean North Carolina. The, um, the president and I had worked together at Benedict, and uh, he was brought in as the vice president for academic affairs and, and all like that. So uh, and he had moved on to be the president of Livingstone College in Salisbury, North Carolina. And he wanted me to come there and work with him. And we talked about it. And we said, well, that's not so far away. You know, so I accepted that. And then he got fired. I think I'd been there the second year. The Board of Trustees terminated him for some reason that was just, I don't understand. But anyway. They, they called him in and said the same day they wanted him to be gone by that evening. Now, how are you going to pack your stuff that quickly and get out? But that's, the, that's how mean they were to him. He had not done anything wrong. <clears throat> they made up something, but they were lying, and they found out later on. Other people found out they were lying, but they didn't apologize. To my knowledge, they didn't apologize, and he was gone on to another school. Um, so... I think that's how I got to Benedict when I left there. Then the, uh, the dean of the College of Education at Benedict was a friend of mine. We hadn't worked, not, we hadn't worked together. We had been to meetings together a lot. And she was highly recognized in, in the field. And she told me she needed me. She said, I understand you're not working. I said, no, I'm not. She said, well, I want you to work. 
I want you to come over here and help me with this teacher ed program. So, so I did, and uh, that was nice. So I got the things mixed up, and I knew I was because I left there and went to uh, Fort Valley. Yeah, so, but not the other way around. But anyway, so those were the, the, the ones, the schools. And then Voorhees College was in trouble. They had lost their teacher ed program. And um, that president called me and asked me if I would come over. And that would be my second job was, would be to get them reaccredited. But my main job would be associate dean of, uh, of the college. So academic affairs, yeah. So that that was my little journey there. I didn't stay there, but I think I stayed there two years, something not long. I think it was two years. Was it? They had a new president to come in, and um, he was a big bully, and uh, he wanted everybody to agree with whatever he said. Now, I wasn't raised like that. Again, I told you, I'm bold. And I didn't agree with everything he said in his council meetings. I said what I believed, not what he wanted to hear. So he didn't like me one bit. And then naturally, I didn't like him one bit. So what he did, he called me in one day. And he said, uh, Dr. Carter, I have this new position I want you to consider. And I said, what? He said, um, what did he call that thing? Chair, uh, distinguished chair of uh, education. I said, oh, I had that honor at another college. So that's, that, that would be going backwards for me. And I'm not willing to go backwards. So he said, he said, but your salary will remain the same. I said, well, you don't know me. Money does not drive me. I said, that's not, that's not what I am. So I, I refused it that day. So I went back to my office. I called my husband and told him what happened. He said, pack your bags and I'll be over there as soon as I get some boxes and we'll bring you home. I said, okay. In the meantime, he called the faculty meeting and he told them that he had offered me a position and I refused it. And um, I had not made up my mind yet whether I was going to change my mind and take it. That's what one of my friends came back from the meeting and told me. I said, he said that? She said, yeah, that's what he told us. I said, you refused it, but you were thinking about it. And he didn't know. I said, oh, he knew. He knew exactly. I'm, I said, I'm almost finished packing off all my stuff. I'm getting ready to leave. So I didn't make it at that school, thank goodness. No. But that's, that's the, the crux of how I got around to all these places. But I, I still believe that it was orchestrated by God. Because I understand from the Bible that he has a plan made for all of us before we are born. So he knows what's going to happen way before we know anything about it. And it's all laid out. So I accept that. No, I, I accept that. It's not convenient, but that's the way it worked for me. Everything wasn't convenient. I made a lot of sacrifices to go to these different schools and be away from my husband that long uh, and all, a uh, big sacrifice. But everything that he has planned for us, it's not promised that it's going to be convenient. And we have to, I feel that we have to do it. When he, and all of, through all of these things, I prayed a lot and asked God for a sign. And I said, please make it a blatant sign to whether I should do this or not. Let me know. And when I, I never got a sign not to do it. What I got was from him, Judy, I gave you this ability. And I didn't give it to you for you to sit on it. You have to help these people. You can do something that they need done. And you have to do it. So I did it. Next question. <laughs> so powerful and so
so, so amazing. And I know that all of the communities that you have touched are so indebted to you for your work and for making it possible for them to continue to have a school to be proud of and to go back to. I mean, that's just so, so amazing. If, if, we, can, <clears throat> if we can talk briefly about this one aspect, can you share with me your advice to other women in leadership roles who have to make certain sacrifices and decisions? Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> I, I will. I will share that because this is what I really believe, and this is what has driven me and made me successful. First, you have faith. We, we have to believe in something. I mean, we we don't we don't we're not able to do these things because we are so smart and all that. That's not why. It's because God is in our lives and. He has a plan, and he lets us know. He has these people calling us. He, he's the one who made, you know, told them to call me for these positions. But so I don't go around. So I will say to young people who, who are still waiting for their opportunity, first, be humble. Don't ever go around thinking that you are all that. Because you're not. You're just a person. You're just a person <clears throat> with an opportunity. And God is going to give you the opportunity to be successful if you do it the right, if you go the right way and accept what He has given you. So be humble, first of all. Respect everybody. Don't think because you might be on the top rung of the ladder or near the top. Don't think that you are, you are so special that you can have to look down on other people. Never, ever, ever should you look down on anybody. I don't care what position they're in. And I taught my son this, and, um, and he mentions this to me quite often because he does it. If when you work in a school and there's a maid and a janitor, respect them, speak to them, have conversations with them. Don't don't think that because they have that job that they have to be looked down on. Uh uh, you don't do that. You don't you don't do that. You will get far more respect from them and others when you include them in your daily routine, speaking. How are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? That kind of thing. And they can help you. But if you treat them bad and don't respect them, they're not going to clean up their classroom like they clean up the other teacher's classroom who, who is nice to them. They might just creep around a little bit, you know, but it's not going to be done right. They'll get you back. And that's how they do it. You know? So um, I, I would say, don't tr be authentic. Just be who you are. You don't have to be anybody else. You don't have to act like anybody else. It, I think it must be mighty hard to try to pretend you are not who you are. I'm somebody else important, and I'm going to strut around here, and I'm going to let them know this. Don't do that. Just be you. And that's good enough. Just be who you are. Don't let other people convince you that you need to be somebody different because you got a job. Don't do that. I had a friend. She passed away a few years ago, and, and she told me, she said, Judy, I've been knowing you a long time, and you are the same Judy <laughs> now that you were when we first got to be friends. I said, well... Her name was Phyllis. I said, Phyllis, what you expect? She said, well, I didn't ex really expect anything different from you, but I just wanted to tell you that you are the same person now. And after all these degrees you've received and all these schools you've been working, and she said, it's just amazing to me that I'm thinking, well, dang, <laughs> what else? It just never occurred to me that I'm supposed to act different. 
And so and that's what I would tell people, because I know people who think that they need to change and be different because of a job. And, and just, just don't do that. I think you'll be happier if you just respect everybody, treat everybody with dignity, and, and, and also you act dignified yourself. And what I, I don't mean be snooty dignified, but I mean be a woman that people can look up to. The way you dress, don't wear party clothes to work. You know, you're going to work. You're not going to a party or a bar. So you have to maybe get a new wardrobe when you get certain jobs. You can't wear everything to every job. And I've seen that. I've worked with people who didn't know. I've had to call. Here I am bold again. I don't know some of these people so well, but I'll call them in. And I will say, honey, what you have on today is not proper for work. You need to go back, look, at, look in your wardrobe, and pick out your conservative-looking clothes that you're going to wear and save the others for parties and going out and that kind of thing. But don't, don't wear those to work because people look at you and they judge you by the way you dress. And you don't want people judging you because you're not that kind of person the way you have what you have on the day. That's not you. So you don't want people thinking that you got on this low cut stuff and short stuff and it's too tight and all of that. No, that's not for work. We're supposed to be role models. We, we have young people looking up to us. And whether we want to be role models or not, we are. Because they look up to us. And they make us a role model. We don't make ourselves a role model. <clears throat> but that's, those are some of the things I would say to them. Um, because obviously nobody else is telling them that stuff. So we have to become the mothers and the grandmothers. And that's the way I always looked at my students. You know, I would just go in and just take over. You know, I, I, I'm your mama. You know, and I'm going to tell you stuff that mamas will tell you. And, and people always said, you know what she said to me? <laughs> Dr. Carter is off a rocker. <laughs> oh, but then when you see them again, they are dressed properly. And sometimes they'll stop by your office and say thank you. So, uh, but that's, those are some of the things I would in part with the the younger people who are trying to move up and um and they will they they will uh <clears throat> you have so many so many of them who have the ability and um they just need somebody to give them a little nudge in the right direction you have so many smart young people out there i was telling my husband <laughs> when i went to the market on the river um yesterday and it was just packed with people and packed with young entrepreneurs black and uh, they got these food trucks and they have um, all these other um, things you know down there making money and I am so proud of them they, they're just smart people and it, it, it just amazes me so I like to go and support them the, the best I can at the market so, but um, I know there are some other things I probably uh, forgot that I would say to young people, but I think the ones I said are the key ones that I would say to them. Thank you so much. That's a lot of wisdom that honestly, truly does need to be imparted with, with each new generation because the culture changes so quickly. Yes. <laughs> it seems. Yes. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say in closing? No, but I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to do this. And I want to thank Corey uh, for calling me and, and telling me that, that I was on the list to do this. I mean, he didn't ask me. He just 
told me. <laughs> but can't say no to Corey because he's done so many wonderful things for, for us uh, as a family. So um, I, I couldn't say no to Corey. Anybody else, I probably would have. But I think it's a good idea um, to do these things for the younger people. Um, because if we don't take the opportunity to try to help them however we can, then who will? And I think we owe it to them. Well, Dr. Carter, we thank you and we want your story and your work to continue to be known and celebrated and now preserved because video can be shared everywhere. So oh, thank we you. We thank you for participating and we thank you so much for your work and the legacy that you have built. Thank you. So you are definitely an inspiration to me and I truly wish that we could talk more because you just, you've done so, so much and it's, it's truly an honor to be in your presence right now. Oh, my so goodness, you're going to make me shed tears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so thankful that you agree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>